And then from there we go to, I think what most people are interested, which is the, which is the 2A and 2B uh, products. So again, here is, on this axis, is just the absolute elevation. This is still 1B. So you see how you have, these are like large elevation numbers in meters. When you go to the 2A data set, then we identify where we think the ground is. We identify where we think the canopy top is. And then once we do that, we can calculate the cumulative waveform profile. And so then we take it over to the 2A, to the 2A realm that you see there and calculate the canopy metrics. And so, for example, this waveform here is, this is the 1B waveform, and then this is the 2A cumulative profile. And then 2B looks at the, the canopy profile metrics, so the LAI is a function of height, or the plane area index is a func function of height, as well as total LAI and the like, which again, many of us would be interested from the forestry perspective. So to get to that, one of the reasons this has taken a long time to get you data is, first of all, we launched six months early, and we weren't quite ready to launch six months early with the data system. So we apologize for that. The second reason is it's really difficult to calibrate data from LiDAR. And so if you're, gonna, if you're somebody that's going to be launching a LiDAR mission anytime soon, it takes a long time to get your calibrations correct. But there's a lot of other things that happen in this process. So for example, we have radiation events that appear on the detectors. And so there are the Van Allen radiation belts, and there are particular spots in space where the radiation is, is particularly intense. For example, right here, this is the South Atlantic anomaly, and when, you're, and when the space station goes through there, you get extra radiation, and it sometimes can trigger your laser detectors. So now you get a signal that looks like, oh, this is a waveform, but it's actually not a waveform, it's noise on your detectors, and you have to, you have to identify that as noise and get rid of it. Um, and then you do have to do the normal cleaning up of your data set to get rid of noise and to get rid of clouds. This is the original data set, and then we have to get rid of the clouds. And so now we have the ocean returns. This is this. And then we also have to get rid of the atmospheric noise that we may see or the dark, dark noise from the detector, and this is the ground surface. So we have to have algorithms that work over a variety of of, over a variety of conditions for all our data sets. And we're getting billions of waveforms. So this becomes a, 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 a time-consuming process. The third aspect of this is getting correct attitude information. Most of us want to be able to use the JEDI data with other data, such as Sentinel or Landsat, where you want to get it over your field plot. And so right now our geolocation is about 10 meters. It should go down to about 7 meters, but getting to that point can take a long time. And the reason for that is you sometimes have bad attitude information from the space station. So when we launch, imagine what the space station looks like. There's a lot of reflecting surfaces on the space station. We have a, what we call a glint model, which is how those surfaces reflect. And before launch, we said, well, when the sun is at a certain angle, sometimes we're going to get sunlight bouncing off the infrastructure of the ISS going into our star trackers and blinding them. But it should only last for one or two minutes, and so we can still find our correct position in precision orbits. But we found that the glint model that they gave us was incorrect, and so we have to do a lot of manual adjustments. The second thing that happens, which is super annoying uh, between you and I, <laughs> is that you have these activities that happen on the space station, and the robotic arm, sometimes they'll park it on top of you. And when you park the robotic arm on top of you, your GPS doesn't work, because you start missing satellites, or what's even worse is they block your star trackers. And so um, that slows things down because when that happens, we have to go. We have to do a lot more calibrations of of our position to get accurate geolocation. And then we again over the variety of conditions and coverages and the like, we have to figure out what are the proper calibrations to apply to the waveforms. And so, for example, we have a waveform like this, and we have to. This, this is where our Algorithm said, okay, well, here's the ground, but is that the ground or was that the ground? Or was that the ground? And so you have to make these kinds of decisions, and then you have to you have to try out various algorithms to decide on which algorithm you're going to use for particular particular lasers, particular locations, and the like, and that takes time. All right, I'm not trying to make excuses, I'm just trying to say it is rocket science and it takes it's it's difficult to do. 
Right, so one of the things that we look at and we spend a lot of time doing is um, before we have accurate geolocation, we have to be able to find these calibrations. So what we do is we do waveform correlation where we compare a Jedi waveform with an Elvis waveform and we shift them until we get the highest correlation. So this is how far we have to shift each of the eight tracks um, to get accurate geolocation initially so that we can start doing calibration. After four, five, six months, you have very beautiful precision orbit determination so that you don't need to do this kind of waveform correlation. You still may want to. And so we do this kind of thing and what you get back is a set of waveform correlations that you're comparing this again with airborne LIDAR data to what we have in space. This is how well they match. So for example, this is Jedi, this is Elvis, and it looks really good. And we see that. But then sometimes you have this happening where you're in the right location and you have real, the ground matches well, but the canopy doesn't match very well. That's because the geolocation is not quite right. You might just be a few meters off to the side and you're missing the top of the canopy. And so this is the kinds of things that we are, we are uh, working on. Again, this is all talking about still the 1A data set and the 1B data set in the life, in looking at the life cycle. And so this is an example of using waveform correlations to look at how well we're doing early on. This is data from the bone over the Afrosar experiment. The red is the, is the airborne data from Elvis and the black is from Jedi. So you can see in this particular case, for this set of waveform, we had great waveform matching, great geolocation. And over these complex forests, we're getting a really good match from Jedi, which is very nice. So now we can look at, um, again, how well we've done looking at a few orbits of data which we've analyzed to compare with Elvis. So this is how well the satellite is working to find ground compared to where Elvis thinks the ground is. And we get a pretty good result so far. And these are for each of the eight tracks. This is the kind of variance we're seeing. And remember that geolocation isn't exact yet. So this is, these are relatively good results um, using quick look and quick look Elvis in provisional geolocation. And then this is RH-98, this is canopy height. And this is looking uh, at two early orbits from Jedi. And, um, but it's looking, it's not cherry picked, what we would say in the US cherry picked, it's just looking at where we happen to intersect all the Elvis data across all the volumes. And it's not looking too bad, actually. And uh, the standard deviation is still a little bit high, two and a half meters, but the mean difference is pretty low. But you can see sometimes Elvis thinks there's a really tall tree. Elvis is saying the tree is 25 meters, but Jedi is saying, well, it's looked like there's nothing there. And um, that happens from that, that's that waveform that I showed you earlier, which is that the geolocation isn't quite right. And so your ground truth is kind of a ground lie here because you're not exactly where, to, where you think you are. And so you're missing the top of the canopy, so the valid, this kind of validation is a tricky business. And this is some data over South Carolina, again from Jedi, showing you the, the kinds of data that you will get access to shortly. Uh, and we can go to the, the, the 2B data set, so the height is 2A. 2B is looking at the foliage profiles, and so this is total LAI of Jedi compared to Elvis. And the results look very good. The RMSC is only about 0.6 for LAI, and so we're getting a really good result here. And then we can also match the LAI looking at profiles within the forest. So here we're looking at, well, this is what Elvis says it sees from 0 to 5 meters in terms of total LAI. And then this axis is what Jedi sees. And as you low down in the canopy, it's very difficult for any sensor to give you really good LAI. So we don't expect the match to be great down here, but as you go higher up in the canopy, you get better and better correspondence. So that's that's looking very good in terms of trying to get the vertical foliage profile. All right, so now I, I wanted to try to give you a live demonstration of the Jedi data viewer that you hopefully will be able to use. Um, let's see, I've got to get to a mouse to start it. Can you click the image? It should go big when you click it. There you go. Okay, so what you see here is these are Jedi tracks. This is for the first three months of data. And what you'll see is a particular area. And then you'll see a bigger map showing you where the area is. There's a screen here that will show you uh, a histogram of the shots that are in your area. Right here. Okay. And then you can zoom out. And then you'll see that there's 
more shots as you zoom around, you can take this map and you'll be able to move the map around and eventually you'll be able to get data by doing this. Right? So you'll see more shots as you move up and down. And then again, this is a histogram. You can change, I know it's a little bit hard to read, but you can set what these colors of these tracks are on what you're interested in, whether it's beam sensitivity or is it a daytime shot or a nighttime shot? Is it a power beam or is it a coverage beam? Uh, right now, this is in terms of sensitivity, which is roughly related to how much canopy cover you think that shot could get through. And so we have our CalVal database. We have 200 sites here. And then we also have different places we could look at. So here's, for example, looking at a forest in Maryland. And again, this is the actual JEDI data. And so what you get back is this waveform here. This red line is the tandem X height, what it thinks tandem X is. And so as you zoom in, you can see this is over a bare field, and so you just see a ground return, which is what you hope to see. Okay, and then again, in it, there's, this is showing you again the sensitivity. The colors here are the sensitivity of the footprint. Uh, what, what it could get through, you'll have the footprint shot, you'll have the latitude and longitude, you'll have all that information sitting there when you look at it. And so then you can, um, again, go and look at another waveform. So just clicking on it, this will appear on your screen, and then you can say, well, what happens when I go into the forest? You know, and hopefully, oh, look, I see a tree. So here's the ground. This is the tandem X height again. It gets caught in the middle of the canopy, and then you see this is the, the forest here, and this is the, this is the canopy height. And this becomes really, really fun to play with. You can look at your field sites, or you can go look at somebody else's field sites, um, and you can, see, <laughs> you can see what you like. And then again, as I said, you can color the the footprints here to, sh to show you something different. For example, is this, is this a night beam or is it a day beam? And these are, I think these are all night. I can't quite read the screen. Um, and again, this is, you can decide how you want to display the data there. Um, this data viewer was made by John Armston, so thank you very much, John. Okay, here's another shot, and there's getting a little bit, you know, this is probably the ground, it's probably the top of the canopy. But this is just the, the, the again, the one beam. So then we can look at, uh, uh, I think it's interesting to take a few minutes and look at some other waveforms from around the world. We promised we would do that. So this is the Pacific Northwest in the United States. This is in the Cascade Mountains. So now you see much taller trees. Uh, and these are usually conifer trees. And again, you can zoom out or zoom in. And so as we zoom in, um, you can see the kind of forest that it is. Again, this is the tandem X height we show on just for fun. But this is the canopy profile that you see. So if you're used to using large footprint waveform data, it looks like what you're expecting to see. Um, and then as we go towards the canyon, you start getting into this river valley, you get uh, start getting a stronger ground return. And then you can um, ask the question, well, how will it work over savanna type of areas? Savannas and boreal regions, as I was talking with Doug Wharton, are places that ice set too should work really, really well given how the sensor is. Um, but Jedi works, oh, looks like it's working okay. This is a, a, a savanna in Australia, savanna woodland. And so you can see that you get a very strong ground return, but you also can see the canopy. So as you zoom in, you can see the kinds of, you see it's a relatively open forest, but you're still able to get a return off of it. And there's another example there that we can see. And then here it's getting a little bit, maybe the canopy, maybe that's the canopy. All right, and then I think we look at a place in, in here in Brazil next. They're actually only about five kilometers away. We have Jedi tracks here, but I didn't have, if we were doing this live, I could show it to you. All right, and so um, this is uh, this area in Brazil. I love looking at these waveforms because they're so complicated. And now we're going to have so many of these looking at this kind of vertical structure and the vertical layer. It's really exciting. I hope it's exciting for you too, so you can see this is a kind of this is the kind of structure that we get back. Uh, looking at these, I'm not sure whether we look at another one. Here's another one. So we get in these kind of complicated waveforms. Again, the tandem X height is stuck somewhere up in the middle of the canopy, as you can see there. And then I think probably we just zoom out and go on. All right. So let's. How much time is? Okay, okay. All right. So um, I wanted to finish with a few other applications. Uh, as I said, we'll talk about 4A later with John Armson. Um, 
When we started Jedi, we, we assumed that Jedi was going to have as a primary use, it was going to be fused with other types of data. And this is why we went to great lengths to try to get the geolocation correct. We're on the space station. You don't really need a star tracker and a GPS. But we have three star trackers and our own GPS. And the reason for that was so that we could precisely geolocate it so that we could do fusion with other types of sensors. Uh, so now for the last four years, we've been working with the, the German Aerospace Center, the German Space Agency, DLR, um, working to, to look at the fusion of JEDI data with their tandem X data. Of course, you can fuse JEDI with NISAR, biomass, that, and a lot of other things, but we've spent a lot of time working with them on looking at tandem X. Tandem X uses are two X-band satellites, and they do satellite interferometry, and you can get actually pretty good structure, canopy structure, out of tandem X. And the idea is, can we use the fusion of Jedi with Tandem X to produce wall-to-wall -wall height and wall-to-wall -wall biomass at a much finer resolution? And in fact, we've just started a major project um, where we're going to have access to that global archive. And so we, we're intending to make that over the next year and a half, this global height map um, as a finer resolution as we can, and a global biomass map much finer than one kilometer going forward. And so um, one of the ways how we're doing this is so we start with the, if you're familiar with tandem X, you have coherence data, and then um, from that, well, you have the, the, the single but complex data, then you get to coherence data, and we have the scattered JEDI data. So the question is, can we take this continuous data, merge it with this other kind of intermittent data to create a, a much better map than either one could produce by themselves? And so in one way that we're doing this is we derive parameters from a, to a particular radar radio transfer model called a random vegetation of the ground. So we use JEDI to parameterize that model, and then, and then when we have tandem X uh, pops out height map, and then we can combine that with, uh, with uh, JEDI data, as you can see over here. Um, this is an example using uh, the Formine model of Andreas Huth, and we can use the height from Jedi to decide where we are in a successional trajectory to initialize the carbon model. And uh, Andreas Huth and his colleagues, Ed and Erodic, they did this for the Amazon, so they used, this is data that we gave them for ISAT-1 to do this. And then we just subsequently um, have an impress paper now where we looked at not just using the height, but using the entire waveform. And so that, their model, the Formine model, will simulate waveforms. And so what it does is it simulates waveforms over a variety of successional states, and then we match the best waveforms to JEDI, and that initializes the model. And if you look at how much better it does, red is where you're initializing your model just with height. Blue, bluish red, is where you're initializing it using the full waveform. And so this is very exciting work. Um, this should be out very soon. The nature of communications. Okay, so let me summarize here. So ecosystem structure has been a major goal of the trust of ecology, as well as um, the forestry community for some time. And we've been trying to do it for about 25 years, get these measurements from space. Um, as we've done it now, we can say that it's been difficult to calibrate and difficult to process, but we're working as hard as we can on the Jedi science team to do this. Um, we think Oops, we think that JEDI will provide this long-awaited baseline, at least for this epoch, uh, that we can use. So, for example, when we have these fires going through Brazil, we can make a kind of guess at how much biomass we've lost. But the data from, also the data from JEDI should really help provide the structure piece within an ecological framework that's emphasizing function and composition. So, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I went a little bit longer. I want to, again, thank John Armstrong very much for the all the hard work he's done at Jedi. And also Laura Duncanson is here, uh, who's been a fantastic ambassador to Jedi. Thank you very much. <laughs>